Dear friends in Christ, on this most holy night in which our Lord Jesus passed over from death to life, the church invites her members dispersed throughout the world to gather in vigil and prayer, for this is the Passover of the Lord, in which by hearing God's word and celebrating God's sacraments, we share in Christ's victory over death. Let us pray. O oh God, through your Son, you have bestowed upon your people the brightness of your light. Sanctify this new fire and grant that in this paschal feast we may so burn with heavenly desires that with pure minds we may obtain to the festival of everlasting light. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The light of Christ. The light of Christ.
Rejoice now, heavenly host and choirs of angels, and let your trumpet shout salvation for the victory of our mighty King. Rejoice and sing now all the round earth, bright with a glorious splendor. For darkness has been vanquished by our eternal King. Rejoice and be glad now, Mother Church, and let your holy courts in radiant light resound with the praises of your people. All you who stand near this marvelous and holy flame, pray with me to God the Almighty for the grace to sing the worthy praise of this great light. Through Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with him in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and good, always and everywhere, with our whole heart and mind and voice to praise you, the invisible, almighty, and eternal God, and your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb, who at the feast of the Passover paid, the, paid for us the debt of Adam's sin, and by his blood delivered your faithful people. This is the night when you brought our fathers, the children of Israel, out of bondage in Egypt and led them through the Red Sea on dry land. This is the night when all who believe in Christ are delivered from the gloom of sin and are restored to grace and holiness of life. This is the night when Christ broke the bonds of death and hell and rose victorious from the grave. How wonderful and beyond our knowing, O oh God, is your mercy and loving kindness to us that to redeem a slave you gave a son. How holy is this night when wickedness is put to flight 
and sin is washed away. It restores innocence in the fallen and joy to those who mourn. It cast out pride and hatred and brings peace and concord. How blessed is this night when earth and heaven are joined and man is reconciled to God. Holy Father, accept our evening sacrifice, the offering of this candle in your honor. May it shine continually to drive away all darkness. May Christ, the morning star who knows no setting, find it ever burning. He who gives his light to all creation and who lives and reigns forever and ever. history, how God saved God's people in ages past, and let us pray that our God will bring each of us to the fullness of redemption. story of creation. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so, God called the dome sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters appear, let the waters under the sky be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm 
and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all the work he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God. Let us pray. O oh God, who wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature, grant that we may share the divine life of him who humbled himself to share our humanity, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Israel's deliverance at the Red Sea. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back and there were Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die here in the wilderness? What have you done to us bringing us out of Egypt? 
Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to keep still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. But you lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the Israelites may go into the sea on dry ground. Then I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And so I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, his chariots, and his chariot drivers. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained glory. Lord, when I have gained glory for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his chariot drivers. The angel of God, who was, going to die, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there in the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in a pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn, the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered their chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. And then the prophet Miriam Aaron's sister took a tambourine in her hand and all the women went out after her with tambourines and with dancing. And Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously, horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God.
Let us pray. O God, whose wonderful deeds of old shine forth even to our own day, you once delivered by the power of your mighty arm your chosen people from slavery under Pharaoh to be a sign for us of the salvation of all nations by the water of baptism. Grant that all the peoples of the earth may be numbered among the offspring of Abraham and rejoice in the inheritance of Israel through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. The valley was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were all dry. He said to me, mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and the skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then the Lord said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are cut off completely. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The word of the Lord.
Let us pray. Almighty God, by the Passover of your Son, you have brought us out of sin into righteousness and out of death into life. Grant to those who are sealed by your Holy Spirit the will and the power to proclaim you to all the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. gathering of God's people. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not hear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time and I will save the lame and gather the outcast and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you home, at the time when I gather you, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth, when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Alleluia! Christ is risen!
Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, who made this holy night to shine with the glory of the Lord's resurrection, stir up in your church that spirit of adoption, which is given to us in baptism, that we, being renewed both in body and mind, may worship you in sincerity and truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. reading from the book of Romans. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive in God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord.
Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. Please be seated. I'd like to start with a um, short poem from John M. C. Crum, who's an Anglican priest, theologian, and poet. Now the green blade rises from the buried grain, wheat that in dark earth many days has lain. Love lives again, that with the dead has been. Love has come again like wheat a rising green. Tonight we gather to celebrate the Easter Vigil, which is the first service of Easter Day. All four Gospels contain accounts of the resurrection and the empty tomb. Tonight we heard Mark's version. Now I know I've heard this Gospel before, but having to prepare a sermon on the text made me read and think about it carefully. And honestly, as in most of Mark's accounts, there is much to unpack in these very concise verses. Mark's account can be a bit confusing at first read. It is confusing because it is difficult to understand how the story could end in this manner. Did Mark intentionally provide what seems to be an incomplete ending to the resurrection story? The story seemingly ends with a moment of failure and disappointment. But the last line describes the women as fleeing from the tomb in terror, amazement, and out of fear, saying nothing to anyone. What kind of ending is this? However, remember the writer is Mark. Throughout Mark's gospel, we seem to hear that those who are closest to Jesus, who should understand his ministry and tell others about him, just don't get what Jesus is about. Jesus predicts his death and the, and the disciples appear confused and argue about who will be the greatest in his kingdom. 
Those who should understand what Jesus is saying and doing just don't get it, and they fail to share the good news. Conversely, those who do understand what Jesus is about and accurately perceive his mission aren't considered credible. The demons cast out by Jesus know who Jesus is and recognize his power, but demons as credible witnesses? David Luce, Lutheran pastor and commentary author, points out that Mark's gospel, that throughout Mark's gospel, the women have proved the most faithful of Jesus' disciples. Some have traveled with him and cared for his needs. They stood at the foot of the cross. But now Mark describes them as too afraid to say anything to anyone. So how do we make sense of Mark's account? Perhaps we need to start at the beginning of the story, at the first verse of Mark's gospel, to truly understand the seemingly abrupt conclusion to this story of the life of the Christ. For Mark's opening sentence to this gospel is as brief and awkward as the closing verse, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Is Mark inviting the reader to pick up the story? Are we now responsible for sharing the good news of the empty tomb? For if it is only the beginning, we do have a part to play. As Christians today, I think the part we are called to play has less to do with the historical case for the empty tomb and more with its meaning, its relevance for us today. Jesuit New Testament scholar Gerald O'Collins frames the issue in the following manner. The difficulty for many people may be with what does it mean rather than did it happen. O'Collins continues focusing on what he posits as the real issue for believers today. What might the empty tomb of Jesus reveal about God and the divine activity on our behalf? To put it simply, how is God made known in the story of death and resurrection of Jesus? And how does it call us to faith and action? If we consider all the events of the last three days, O'Collins calls our attention to three notable contrasts contained in Mark's accounts. Darkness and light, absence and presence, silence and speech. We have the darkness of the garden, the darkness enveloping the earth at the crucifixion, and the darkness of the tomb, contrasted with the risen sun that accompanies the women to the light-filled tomb. The first revelation we are given is that God overcomes darkness and death. God is able to bring about what is not humanly possible, opening the tomb, which was a source of worry for the women, and raising the dead. The second contrast, absence and presence, occurs when the women enter the tomb. The women came to anoint the dead Jesus, but Jesus is absent. He is risen. Instead, they encounter a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right. Jesus' presence is made known through this angelic messenger. The third contrast, silence and speech, is contained in the angel's message and the women's silent response. From the description of the young man, we can assume that he is an angel. Shining white robes are the traditional clothing of heavenly messengers. O'Collins calls our attention to the manner in which the message is delivered by the young man. The angel remains seated and speaks with authority. This posture is in keeping with how Old Testament judgments were delivered. The women respond with amazement, even alarm, which seems to be understandable and somewhat the standard reaction to a visit from an angel. The angel tries to allay their fears by reassuring them, do not be alarmed, advising them that Jesus is risen and giving them a message for the apostles. So the encounter ends with the amazing but confident words of the angels, contrasted with the silence and flight from the tomb of the women. So how are we to interpret this ending? Some commentary suggests that Mark's account ends with human failure and collapse. Pastor Luce sees it as a call to action for the followers of Jesus today. The Jesuit scholar O'Connell 
suggests that we need to more closely examine the behavior of the women in the account. He notes that the women remain true to Jesus to the end, even coming to the tomb to complete the required burial rites. He suggests a careful reading of the entire Gospel of Mark demonstrates that over and over, the response to what Jesus says and does is met with alarm, silence, fear, amazement, and even terror. Jesus' teachings and miracles are meant to manifest that God is among us. O'Collins notes that wonder, amazement, fear, terror, and astonishment are the proper human reactions to the presence and power of God. But how do we make sense of the silence and the flight from the tomb by the women? O'Collins suggests that perhaps we need to again understand these reactions as appropriate human responses. He suggests such responses are not failures of faith, but are consistent with divine revelations and manifestations. Silence, he notes, is often the initial response to a divine encounter. Perhaps we should see the initial silence of the women as temporary. The message will be del delivered to the apostles, as they did eventually go to Galilee. The women's response is in keeping with the angel's message and to the climax of divine revelation, which has occurred in Jesus' resurrection. O'Collins summarizes Mark's verses as God has triumphed over evil, the divine kingdom is breaking into the world, and the victimized Jesus is finally vindicated as the Son of God. Mark's verses can give us much to reflect upon. And just as the women did at the tomb, perhaps this evening we should take some time to wonder and discern what the awesome and amazing gift of the Christ's resurrection means for us today. As Pastor Luce points out, Jesus' resurrection isn't a conclusion it is an invitation. It is an invitation to continue Jesus' mission. If we accept Jesus' call to continue his mission, there is much still to be done. Locally, we continue to deal with the lack of affordable housing and some of the highest property taxes in the United States. Nationally, there's an issue of rising food costs, attempts at controlling women's management of their own bodies, and increasing xenophobia and transphobia. Internationally, war continues on multiple fronts. The effects of climate change impact the world food supply, and there is increased flooding and wildflower, uh, wildfires. And of great concern is the continued rise of fascism. If you ever wonder why there is still so much pain, anguish, and distress in the world, it's because the work begun by Jesus has not been completed. Mark tells us it is only the beginning. We are called to continue the work with the marginalized, to comfort the sick and dying, to work against the forces that create and perpetuate injustices. We are to share the good news of Jesus, which in his words, actions, death, and resurrection demonstrate that there is triumph over injustice and death. It is only the beginning. Amen. the Paschal mystery, dear friends, we are buried with Christ by baptism into his death and raised with him to newness of life. I call upon you, therefore, now that our Lenten observance is ended, to renew the solemn promises and vows of holy baptism, by which we once renounce Satan and all his works and promise to serve God faithfully in God's holy Catholic Church. Do you reaffirm your renunciation of evil and renew your commitment to Jesus Christ. I do. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son, of, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. 
he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers? Will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God and Christ? My will, God's help. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? My will, God's help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? My will, God's help. May Almighty God, through his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who has given us a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit, and bestowed upon us the forgiveness of sins, keep us in eternal life by his grace. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. God, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That you may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of the word of silence. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That they may Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our mercy might favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may deliver from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. But light and light shall shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also let us pray for our own needs and those of others. I ask your prayers tonight for those who are risking their lives. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Good evening. I invite you to take a seat for a few moments, a couple moments. Uh, I want to welcome everyone who might be visiting with us tonight um, here at Trinity. It's great to have you here with us. Uh, my name is Chase uh, Danford. I'm the priest here at Trinity. And if you're visiting with us, um, uh, again, a big welcome to you. We have some welcome bags. If you didn't get one, you can ask one of the ushers and greeters for one as you uh, leave the service. 
and I hope you'll introduce yourself as well. And please note that there are some welcome cards in the pew racks in front of you that you can take and fill out and put in the offering plate um, as that comes by. Um, please note that tomorrow we do have a full schedule of Easter Day services. Um, if uh, you'd like to join us for any of those, we'll start at 635 on the north end of the boardwalk. Um, there's a parking lot up that way, and you can just uh, park and then walk down and you'll find us. Um, and uh, that's always a really lovely service. Uh, dress warmly. It's always windier and colder than you think. Um, and then, of course, we have the rest of the morning services here, uh, and uh, it will be great to see everyone. Um, just uh, take note of all the other announcements in the bulletin. Uh, lots of great things coming up. Um, opportunities for confirmation class, etc. Um, and finally, I just want to say a big, big thank you to everyone who has participated in making uh, this such a uh, beautiful and moving Holy Week and, um, and Easter celebration. Uh, to all those who have uh, given towards the Flower and Music Fund, to uh, the choir and musicians, and uh, to uh, Michael Parent, who's helping out on the organ, um, and um, to um, all of our wonderful vergers, um, and everyone who's volunteering. Uh, just thank you so much. Um, and all the preachers who've been preaching this week, uh, thank you. It's been a wonderful Holy Week and Easter, and will continue to be tomorrow. So um, thank you again, everyone. And um, happy Easter, everyone. In a moment, we're going to be celebrating Holy Communion. All are welcome to receive, and there are some uh, directions if you um, um, need those in the bulletin about what to do. Um, walk in love as Christ loved us. He gave himself for us.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound of praise for your glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Glory and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace. You looked upon favor with, upon your servant Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among, among us, us, Jesus loved us. us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed the news to the glower. He learned to draw all the world to himself, and yet we are heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. We remember that on the night that Jesus was gathered together with his disciples, he took bread. Father, he asked you to bless the bread, and then he broke it and shared it among his disciples and friends, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken and given for you. Do this always to remember me. Then he passed around a cup of wine, saying, Drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood of a new covenant, it to be shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you gather together again in my name, do this to remember me. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ, 
crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come. We offer you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts that they may be the body of Christ, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of the time, bring us with the everlasting Virgin Mary and all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be all honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior has taught us, we join together in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Brothers and sisters, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Jesus has given his life for you. So now feed on him by your hearts by faith. Amen.
I invite us to stand as we are able for our post-communion prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever to the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. And now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, giving us music and voices to sing this night, make you perfect in every good work that you do God's will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in God's sight. And may the blessing of God Almighty, who is our creator, our redeemer, and giver of life, be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Amen.